Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Just as they did in the 60s and 70s, feminists are bringing new definitions and expectations to the rest of their lives. Suzanne Braun Levine, expert on issues concerning women and families, writes about those challenges and opportunities of these later years with wisdom and enthusiasm, and she's my guest today. Welcome. Thank you. You remember those heady days of the 60s? You oh. were Ms. Magazine's, in the 70s, I guess, Ms. Magazine's first editor. I was. And you did it for 17 years. I did. <laughs> and, you know, those were such exciting times, weren't they? Unbelievable. And I, looking back, I cannot understand where we got the nerve. Is that to right? To do what we did. Yeah. It was, I think it was because we had each other. And you'd come to the office in the morning and people would say, this isn't fair. Or this woman is brave. Or uh, there's a protest going on here. And without processing it, really. Yeah. We all did it. We all did it. It was all that comfort of friends. Right. And together. Right. Together. Right. And we did, I mean, it was the age of consciousness raising, too, which was, what, finding common things? Well, that, if you think about it, yeah. one of the things Ms. Magazine did was simply put names to life experiences because you can only talk about things if you have words for it. And when you, Gloria always said, uh, it, we came up with words like sexual harassment or uh, uh, battered women or... Um, um, Just the, the term is. The term Ms. <laughs> women's health, That's reproductive freedom. And yeah. she says they always used to call it life. That's interesting. But as soon as it was as soon as women started talking honestly about these things, yeah. um, and we had the language, yeah. it then was it was on and, the way. And it was the sharing, because up until then, it was, you knew something was wrong yourself, but you didn't realize that other people felt the same way about the same things. That's right. right. It's that common, right. common sharing. You felt I it must be your fault, wrong or here. you were crazy. And right. the other thing was that at that time, those of us who were adults at that time, w had been raised not to trust other women. So mm -hmm. that a lot of the posturing that women did, oh, I can bake cookies and get my kids off to school in perfect little outfits, was because you didn't want to be vulnerable to other women. We had been raised to think that other women were our, our competitors in everything, especially men, that women were devious, that girls in groups were vicious. <laughs> and it really took the camaraderie of the women's movement you to turn You went to women's that, college, though, didn't you? It was a fake women's college. Which I one? went to Radcliffe. Radcliffe. So we were basically in got Harvard, Harvard diplomas, yeah. but we were second class. And I citizens. went to Barnard, but it was still, I, it, yeah. I didn't get that feeling of reliance on the other women. We were still over at Columbia. Yeah, a lot of yeah. But that, isn't that partly because our vision was, I mean, many of us thought the role in life was, you know, go get an education, work a little bit. Get a get man. Get married. Get a man. And, and then what you... happened <laughs> after that? We never thought yeah. beyond the children, That's right. right. But then the other saying was, um, the personal is political. Right. And I never, I don't know if I've ever quite understood it, but it is meaning that what you feel, other people are feeling, right. and we can take some action. Well, even beyond that, I have been writing about my life that's and what I was women's leading up into lives. This. Exactly. Because uh, that's what you were doing. And in the process, I was so much learning about my own life. And by doing that, or in the same process, I was able to explain to other women like me what was happening. Because this feeling of being the only one or mm -hmm. being crazy um, is with you for life. Mm -hmm. And even as we get older, the idea that we want to be taken seriously in, a, in an ageist culture uh, makes you think you're a little crazy, too. So uh, when I write about getting older, it's a similar message. It is, yeah. I, you're a little behind me. You're a little younger than I am. Mm. 
a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a decade or so, whatever it is. So when we were at Ms., what were we in our 30s or 40s? 30s, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. And now as we've aged, and you went from Ms. to uh, the Columbia Journalism Journalist Review. Re Review, and then you started writing books. Right. Um, and you started, the first one was about, was it more about your husband? <laughs> It was well. It was more about what I wished he would oh. be as a father. <laughs> it was hard for him. Yeah. It was hard for men. It was called Father Courage. What happens when men put family first? And it's amazing to me because that book came out in two thousand and one. And at that point, men were telling me. Uh, that one man, I'll never forget this story. He told me he went to the park during the day with one, with his young daughter and the uh, mothers in the park watched him for a while and then they called the police because they thought he was some kind of a pervert it was that unusual yeah. and now where I live it's filled, uh, it's filled with men with mm. pouches and strollers mm. and uh, you know wiping <laughs> noses and they're so into it it's been an amazing Transformation. Yeah. So you've written you've written a series of books. Yep. I just finished reading the most recent one, which is about girlfriends, which I loved, and so I immediately started thinking about all my old friends and called my oldest, I guess, from high school. But the next book was talking about the future, wasn't it? What was the well, next the, book? The in girlfriends book is the most recent. Recent, yeah. Yes. But what came after the men? What was oh, the, the man was it? inventing the rest of our lives, exactly. and that was the sort of exploratory book about what's going on. It was clear to me that um, we didn't want to move past 50 and move into that kind of life that our mothers had. It was clear to me that we had no idea what the alternative was, and uh, that the issue really was what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And so that was the first one. The second one was called 50 is the new 50. I would say that life after 50 is full of promise and possibility and fun and adventure and courage and all those things. And they would say, oh, I get it. 50 is the new 30. But the point is 50 is better than 30. Uh. And most of the women that I have ask, would you rather be 30 yeah. again? Say, absolutely not. That time no. was the hardest time of my life. I didn't know who I was. I couldn't get to the things that meant something to me. Uh, and 50 is a kind of a right. rebirth. When you've got the more confidence and a yeah, better that's center. Right. And, that's right. And you, know. you basically don't care what people think. That's the turning point. At some point, you hear yourself say, you know what, I don't care what people think anymore. And as soon as you break through, break away from trying to please people, trying to figure out what people want from you and then give it to them, um, you are suddenly on a very strange road because you have to get to know yourself all over again. And what was the next book? The next book <laughs> was called How We Love Now and it was about intimacy because um, I also began to understand that... How old were you when you wrote that? It was about five years ago, so I was... Uh, I'm going to be 72 on Friday. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> it's such a baby. <laughs> so um, I realized that along with everything else that changes, our needs and our willingness to participate in intimate relationships change. And like other aspects of our lives, we've become much more selective. We don't want to waste time with unsatisfactory relationships. We want to pay more attention to what's important. And lots of us have called up old mm -hmm. high school girlfriends. And it's wonderful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. It's great fun. You and just pick up where you exactly. left off. Exactly. And um, <laughs> what this intimacy means going forward, um, a lot of people, I don't have grandchildren, but a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. just fall apart 
<laughs> you know, with delight over their grandchildren, and that that's a special kind of intimacy. I have six grandchildren that I will throw myself in front of any bus for at any time. They are unbelievably just delicious and wonderful, and it's, I, it, and I can't explain why. That's what, it, it, somebody said to me that the only way they can explain it is that you feel unconditional love, but what's even more amazing is that you are getting it back, mm. that this is just a totally pure connection. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, we'll come back to that, but then... What came after that? Is that now the friend? So that then I came the, the, you got to have girlfriends. girlfriends. A post-50 posse is good for your health. And, the, and, you, you, um, and you quote all kinds of scientific information. Well, that's what's amazing, that uh, we all knew that, uh, you know, you, uh, girlfriends can make a bad day better, um, <laughs> that they can help you solve problems and all of that. But basically... Um, I've certainly said, oh, I haven't got the time to mm -hmm. spend with my girlfriends. I've got more important things to do. Or for my health, I need to go to the gym rather than go with my girlfriends. Turns out that not only are we fun and important, but that physiologically um, we give each other an amazing dose of uh, a variety of positive hormones one of which is oxytocin, which is the nursing hormone. It's called the cuddle hormone. And what it does is it re reduces stress. It kind of just washes over you and calms you down. And women together, doing what we do with our friends, um, release that hormone in the process. And it's thought that one of the reasons we live longer than men is because we have regular doses of this stress-reducing experience. So we go from basically, I'm going to start with babies, I guess, from the cuddling and the, the nurturing of children, right, to the nurturing of spouses or other people who are closely related, and then to yourself. That's a nice way to put yeah. it. And then, but then to bring in the friends. We've always talked about the importance of laughter and fun, which is important. And you can laugh more with girlfriends. You can laugh, you can laugh at ourselves more with girlfriends, Absolutely. can't you? Absolutely. It's a special kind of laughter yeah. that uh, without, in any other context, it, you don't laugh like that. Mm -hmm. And as we age and go through these unbelievably uh, confusing accumulation of indignities, there's nothing that short circuits one of these poor me things yeah. um, than saying to your friends, you won't believe this. <laughs> you won't believe this, but my, um, uh, my lips are gone. Or um, I, just <laughs> I just discovered that when I brush my hair bending over, my face falls <laughs> into my eyes. And it's a horrible thing to... You have no waste. <laughs> and you have... Well, that happened a long time ago. no waste. You have no uh, waste and no memory. So, so. <laughs> you're also blogging, and I see that you're starting to talk more about ages, because as you get older, you're approaching each of these stages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the ageism in society is really hard, isn't it? It's very hard, and especially for women, uh, because... Uh, it really was a convention that when a woman reached it, this change of life, as it used to be called, her life was supposed to stop changing. Mm -hmm. And basically the image was a, a shrinking old lady with shopping bags full of her grandchildren's favorite food. And the whole notion of going on with your life, to continuing to have an impact, to have discoveries, to um, engage with the world, uh, it's, it's a blank slate. And leaving behind it seems to me, it's, what makes your work so interesting is it's not only for people your age to share the experience, but it's also in a way preparation for younger people 
to what they can expect and what they should be looking out about. Right? It's important. I'm so glad you said that because that was an unanticipated uh, reaction. And I am so delighted that younger women in their 40s, say, mm -hmm. who are beginning to think they'll never get to do this or that or they'll never get a good night's sleep again <laughs> or um, they'll never be themselves again. They'll, they're just suffocating in roles. They say to themselves, gee, if I can age like that, we are creating role models for mm -hmm. a new stage of life. And what's unprecedented about this stage of life is that it comes, you know, you, you, we all know we live longer. And somehow the way we picture it is that we, the, the piece of longer life that we're getting is at the end. So it's like from 70 to 95. But it's really in the middle. It's a, little, it's a new wedge between adulthood and age that is a chunk of time that has never been explored before. It's, it's really and we're doing it. And then at the end, I mean, I'm I always delighted in telling people how old I was. My mother used to lie. She used to, went, she had her knees operated on, and I remember in the hospital, she would say to, people would say, you look very well, Amy, and she'd say, well, I'm 90 years old, when in <laughs> fact she was 85. And she wanted people then to say, oh, you look wonderful. So I was always <laughs> pleased with telling my age, which is getting up there. And now I find I'm a little more reserved because the minute you say 80, you're kind of pushed aside. And I feel I have a lot of important things to say. <laughs> right. And I also find for my political thing, when I meet younger politicians, I want to tell them things about the older days. I, we don't seem to have a living respect for history. Yeah. Do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We sure. study history in school and it's something detached. But people in the process of making history, I don't think are as interested in learning more about their recent past than I they are in proceeding. True. I so I think yeah. it has a lot of political yeah. ramifications yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. Just simply in terms of organizing, you yeah. re you're reinventing the wheel. Yeah. But in terms of understanding, even a simple message like you're not crazy and you're not the only one yeah. is uh, very, imp yeah. very important and part of the personal is political history. I think you're absolutely right. The, um, the, the question also of women uh, reaching in their 50s and what happens afterwards, I mean, that's a major political problem. Uh, women who, more women single, more women supporting yeah. themselves, right. uh, dependent on their salaries and income, harder to find jobs, less, fewer opportunities for them. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. But I, you say that you've always said your age, and I think that's a political act. If it, it, more of definitely. us said our age, we would redefine that age. Absolutely. Because I think I could get away with being 65. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important, and it's very hard to say you're 70 or 80, because none of us is immune to, you know, how... Well, I don't know if they'll keep it. me in my job if I tell them that I'm 82 <laughs> years old, so we'll have to figure out. But it, maybe it's better to go public, then they can't, then I can charge them with That's right. discrimination. That's right, there you go. <laughs> But it is, um, and, I, and I have, my friends divide up into different age groups. I mean, I think it's also especially important to have younger friends. Yeah. 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 And harder to um, be in situations where you can make younger friends. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting in terms of, one of the things that women often do in their second adulthood is to go back to school. And one of the reasons they give is to make friends especially with younger women. And then they use the internet, a lot of women. Yes. How do you do that? I mean, how, <laughs> if you're a single woman, if, or if you're a woman and you're looking for friends and you're trying to plan your, your life, what are you suggesting? Well, there are Be active. It, amazing, uh, there's something in New York that I write about in You Gotta Have Girlfriends that I cannot now remember the name of, of course. But it's an organization that posts activities that are going on. And you go to whatever you want to go to. 
and then you respond to it. Um, but you can fill your day with activities that will involve people that have been vetted that you are likely to find interesting and that yeah. could be, it's the same as we used to say uh, to our daughters, uh, I mean, mothers used to say to us about meeting men that you should go where right. you will be doing something you're interested right. in and he will be right. there for What's the Encore.org? That's a, an organization it's you're a involved wonderful, in. I'm on the board. It used to be called Civic Ventures. It was founded by Mark Friedman, who is um, the Gloria Steinem of ages. <laughs> he is, um, he has this visionary sense of what people over 50 can contribute to society, are entitled to, how the world can be better um, for everybody if what he calls the most underused civic resource in the country is neglected. And the organization is coming up uh, with both research that confirms this and uh, uh, programs to make it, to, to show what we can do. Mentoring programs, uh, career paths, uh, and again, making people who are struggling with the world that you've described of ageism uh, understand they're not alone and that we can change it. There's something, you know, I mean, we so admire youth and the uh, vitality and that energy that generates. But also at the same time, people complain that they're young people, at least in my business or in business generally, I think there's a certain curtness and a lack of um, I don't know if you'd call it civility, but gentleness or understanding or compassion. And that's, I think, the ingredient that older people could really uh, hand down to Absolutely. younger people. Especially, that's yeah. one of the selling points in the job market, yeah. it, specifically, is that we have people skills. Mm -hmm. And that if we bring our people skills into an organization, um, not only is the organization more people friendly, but the younger staff can begin to understand what that means. So, so when, is, when is your next um, occasion with your friends? <laughs> I have a group of friends, uh, we were f five, now we're four, unfortunately, who mm -hmm. have been having dinner once a month since 1989. At the end of each dinner, we schedule the next one so we don't miss a beat. And um, it is almost like getting your period, you know, it's part of the, monthly. it's the monthly cycle. And as we approach uh, these dinners, I begin to process what I want to share, what I want to hear, and I get hungry for that kind of laughter and that great sort of wave of And these trust. are women you worked with? We worked together at Ms. Yeah. And, and then when we went our separate ways, we yeah. began to have these That's dinners. so great. I, I saw you listed the kinds of friends. So you have some friends from high school or from grade school. I don't I know do. how long. And, and you cite which each group what their value is. The friends who knew you from when you were young, who knew your family. Yeah. and who knew what the house that you lived yeah, in looked like. Yeah. And that, does, that brings you a what? A sense of, of authenticity. authenticity. I think it's because some, at some level you know that they know something about yeah. who you are. And that's, this is one great uh, gift of the internet. Yeah. People are finding these childhood friends. I found and a friend from when I was in first grade. That's pretty good. Through her brother <laughs> in California up to Westchester. It was really interesting, yeah. And have you seen her? And we've just talked to each other, you know, emailed each other or written, actually on the phone because she doesn't email. Uh -huh. And that became an obstacle in her <laughs> life, I don't know. But it was, it was interesting. But you must have recognized her voice, I'll bet. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We played school together in her base, the basement of her house. <laughs> but anyway, it was interesting. Well, I have a friend from um, third grade, and um, 
there's just something you, <laughs> I don't know what it is, you, you feel safe. Yeah. And you share your mother with her and, and the, everything else, yeah? Yeah, and, yeah. and there's parents, so much confusion family. about your family that here's somebody you can yeah. kind of check it out so, with. So this, this last book about friends, you got to have friends, is an e-book. Yes. It's not a physical book. Exactly. Um, and so, how do you get it? <laughs> you go on Amazon. It's published by Open Road, which is the first e-book publisher. And um, you go on Amazon the same way you would to order any other book, except that it is, the price is the price of a greeting card. So yeah. if you want to send your girlfriend a hello, it's $1.99. That's a great idea, isn't and, it? And um, there it is. And you can even, I've discovered, give my ebook to somebody uh, on Amazon. I'm not sure okay. how you do that. And they also can go to your own website. Yes, SuzanneBronLevine.com. And it shows all the books. All the books. And it talks about your blogs. And it has an archive of all my blogs. And it's fascinating and reading and very comforting. And it really can help you get through your day-to-day -day trials and tribulations with a smile, I think. I hope so. So we've come to the end of this program. I hope you come back again. I would love to. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.